Hello and welcome. My name is Dawson Church. I'm the author of several best-selling science books, including Mind Matter, The Gene in Your Genes, and Bliss Brain. I also love research, and I really appreciate the perspective science gives us on healing. So I am thrilled today to share time and information and inspiration with my friend, Steve Wells. Steve has been active in the field of psychology since 1985 and has been using EFT tapping since 1997. He is also the co-founder of a method called Simple Energy Techniques and the author of the book, Enjoy Emotional Freedom. He also, with a group of talented colleagues, actually did the very first randomized controlled trial of EFT it was of uh, people's phobias of small animals like rats and mice and snakes and bats and cockroaches, things like that, and showed a significant effect. It was published in a major journal in 2002 and really paved the way for many other research projects, adding to the more than 100 clinical trials there are of EFT today. So, Steve, it's always a joy to connect with you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Jawson. It's fantastic to join you. Mm. Just- so... Sorry, busily watching a fly walk around behind you. <laughs> I, I, I was tapping below my desk and trying to ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I got a little yeah. distracted as it went across the screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you, you, you try and have everything go perfect and then a fly flies it from the outside. And so <laughs> it's our first actually warm spring day here in Petaluma, California. And so the, the things that people tapped on in your Wells phobia study are now out in force. <laughs> well, exactly what I was thinking when it when it uh, walked across, because I thought, is this a is this a um, a fly or is it a cockroach? Because uh, you know we we covered cockroaches and you know all small animals basically. It was a very fun time. Well, I, I have been known to plant things, but that actually wasn't wasn't me. It was just a random <laughs> station from from Mother Nature, and so um, we find ourselves individually, collectively, globally, in the middle of these interlocking crises. And Steve, I've been so uh, surprised by the degree of fear that people have, because like people who are on my email list, they, they're doing EFT tapping, the tappers, some of them have been tappers for a long time, for decades, like you and me. Many of them are meditators. They've been using eco-meditation, other forms of meditation, often for a long time. But like I talked to one elderly man, well, I guess as, as, I get, as I get older, I'm kind of rapidly catching up to him, but uh, <laughs> and it was, he was so panicked about the situation. And I was thinking, this guy's a tapper, he's a meditator, and yet his fear was sky high. I've been doing yeah. these group calls with people and they've been posting their fears in the chat room. And even though these are people who have these advanced tools at the disposal, the degree of fear of the unknown, fear of um, threats to their families, fear of, of financial ruin, these interlocking fears, fear of big government, fear of um, predatory corporations, fear of uh, an unknown financial future. There are so many fears now and, and they just need to be overwhelming people's ability to cope. So sure. what's your take on this? And uh, what are you finding as you work with people and also in your own consciousness of the crisis? Well, I think it's the same for all of us. We're all human and we're all potentially impacted by what happens in the world. And um, and we all forget what we have in a moment when we get overwhelmed, you know? So in that state where we're, we're dealing with the overwhelm, we forget our resources. We lose contact with our resources, you know? I always tell people that tapping works when you use it and it doesn't work when you don't. But even I... And I'm sure you as well occasionally find myself in a state and then it's like, wow, I've been in a state for a while and I I have a way to get out of that. And sometimes you can even be in that state and you're so far down that you know what you should do, but just even getting yourself to do something as simple as tapping, you know, can, can be difficult. Um, so I think that the, the thing that's different about this situation, it's so uh, widespread, it's collective. We're all in this together. And, uh, you know, this is the first time that uh, most people who are alive now have experienced a worldwide event like this. You know, I mean, we had 
you know, we had the global financial crisis. Turns out that was a blip, you know, <laughs> in comparison, uh, I think most people would agree to, to what's happening now. Plus a lot of people in the healing field um, they pick up on other people's feelings very, very easily. And, um, you know, it can be a, a, a problem for, for a lot of people. You know, I've, I've worked with a lot of practitioners to help them to be able to manage that and to be able to allow uh, feelings to move through them and flow through them so they don't get stuck. Um, otherwise, then you have other people suffering and you're suffering as well. And you, you don't bring anything to the party other than more suffering. Um, so it's, it's sometimes it's a reminder to, to use the resources that you have. And sometimes we just need to connect with other people, you know, like we're doing here, even just connecting with, uh, with us virtually in a way is kind of like, okay, let's, let's do this, you know? And when I, um, when I run workshops, you know, David Lake and I discovered a long time ago, what we call continual tapping. We have people tapping on the points the whole time. And we encourage them while they're watching, while they're listening, while they're participating, just to keep on tapping the whole time. And routinely, those that do that, their overall stress levels progressively come down and their confidence and good life energy comes up. We call it energy toning. So I would say if you're watching now, if you're listening now, and you know tapping, start tapping. And if you're watching now and you're listening now and you don't know tapping, start tapping anyway, because... <laughs> You can't you can't do it wrong unless you tap too hard and you know and or or you know hit yourself in your eye or something. You just tap gently on your uh, on your body and you're gonna have a beneficial effect. Yeah, and I love that method of continuous tapping. You start at the top of your head, start here on your governing meridian, work your way down through the points, get to the end point, and then start again. And just tap as you talk, and just that is usually enough to produce a really rapid decrease in stress. On those Zoom calls, I was noticing that people would post their, their first number and their last number. And some people literally in like 15 minutes of continuous tapping were going from a 10 to a zero. Others were going from an eight to a four or a five, maybe down to a two. And um, just that simple technique of adding tapping is, is powerful. Of course, if you if you recite your problems and talk about your issues and your fears without tapping, you re-traumatize yourself. You get back into all those old neural patterns and you often feel worse. And so it's it's powerful, simple and powerful to yeah. tap continuously while you tell the world or other people your story. Oh yeah, and the way we use tapping, which as you know, we call simple energy techniques, um, you don't even have to use words. You can simply tap um, we've, we've found that, first of all, just tapping without, you can tap, um, you know, in a focused way where you're focusing on your problems, you notice the feelings, you notice the thoughts, you know, you're focusing on the thoughts, you're focusing on the images, you focus on the feelings, and you work through the different aspects of the problem. We've also found just tapping alone. And uh, the great thing is, you know, we can send clients away and just say, don't try to be clever, don't try to be a psychologist, just, just tap on the points. Because people can get hung up thinking, oh, I have to come up with the words or I have to come up with the core issues or whatever. And uh, when we do that, they do more tapping and they get better results, you know. So um, they come back and they've done tapping. You know, we recommend if you can do an hour of tapping a day. I mean, right now I'd be recommending that to everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, you don't have to tap on the upper body points, especially if you haven't washed your hands before you you tap, by the way, you should be washing your hands. I've washed my hands and therefore it's okay for me to tap on my face points. But we also teach tapping using the finger points. Now, now the finger points were in the original long version of EFT that um, uh, Gary Craig uh, created from Callahan's uh, Thought Field Therapy. Um, and it's not used now in, in most cases, people just using a shortcut version, you know, starting at the top of the head and so on, just like you showed us. But we also use the finger points and we get we get people to tap on the finger points using the thumb of the same hand. So you can tap on the side of the index finger like this, on the side of the um, middle finger. We incorporate the ring fingers, just easier. Uh, I know technically the point is on the bottom, but we just get people to tap on that point anyway and on the little finger. And then you can also wrap around uh, one of these fingers and tap on the side of the thumb point. Now, 
I can be sitting here doing this while I'm talking with you. You wouldn't necessarily know that I was doing that. So if I'm in a business meeting, you know, online uh, and, and speaking with you, because that's now where everyone's doing their business meetings, right? They're, they're doing them online. So I can be sitting there just underneath the table, just tapping like this. You know, I've taught my corporate clients to do this. Too. They're in presenting to the board and they're sitting uh, there and under the table, they're just tapping gently on these points. And they're soothing and tuning and toning their energy and their anxiety and stress is coming down and their good life energy is starting to flow. Oh, hang on, we lost your sound. And those two things work in inverse relationship. So when your stressful feelings go down, then your feelings of well-being tend to go up. And I, as I've done studies of cortisol, I've been so interested to see that down gradually over a few days of tapping, and then all kinds of beneficial biochemicals start to rise. And in one cool study I did, Steve, we, we found that uh, after a week of tapping with meditation every morning at a retreat center, that people's cortisol dropped by an average of 37%. So their baseline cortisol went way down. And their levels of antibodies immunoglobulins that protect against viruses, bacteria in the mucous membranes and the in the eye fluid in the gut, those levels of antibodies went up by 113%, more than doubling over the course of the week. So it was a real example of that inverse relationship between stress yeah. and relaxation. When you reduce stress, that gives your body a chance to recover, make all kinds of good and helpful biochemicals, and generally makes you both healthier and happier. Well, and this is what we notice when we're working on issues and problems and challenges is that, you know, when you're, you know, I say when your anxiety or your stress or your overwhelm is up here and your good life energy is down here, now all your negative thoughts seem real. Now, when you think of your, you know, your worst case scenarios, you're more attached to them. You tend to go into them more as if they're real and experience them as if they're real. When this stress and overwhelm and anxiety comes down and the good life energy comes up, now you can have the same thoughts, but they don't have anything to attach to. And so, um, and then when when this starts to, to come up, now that just, you just naturally can see the other side to things. You don't have, you know, I say a stuck feeling is a stuck perspective. And uh, it's also, you know, to, to do with a kind of uh, resistance or a disturbance in flow in the body, you get your energy flowing, you're feeling better, you're thinking better all at the same time. Yeah, I'm thinking, feeling, and thinking better and feeling better also go hand in hand. So as your emotional tone is regulated, then your ability to think creatively and effectively is really increases. I know that um, in some of the research I wrote about in one of my books, we looked at that kind of relationship and we found that when people were bringing themselves into flow states, so when they were meditating, when they were inducing flow, in various ways in their lives. There are lots of ways to produce flow, tapping's one, time and nature's another, movement therapies, other body-based therapies, breathing, mindfulness. But when they'd induced those states, the remarkable measurement was that they were five times as productive, and not 5% not more productive, 50%, but 500% more productive when they had released that stress and all of those biological, intellectual, and emotional resources were now being brought to bear on solving their problems. So this pays off big time in the real world. Yeah, oh yeah. I think the challenge, you know, you were talking before about, you know, people uh, being so disturbed and, and so on, is that often when we get under the weather, as David Lake would say, you know, or underwater with our problems, it it's kind of like we don't even always realize at that time that we're suffering because it's kind of creeps up on us subtly, you know, that the anxiety progressively creeps up during the day. And at the moment, you know, you can get anxiety from watching the news. You can get anxiety from your uh, social media feed. You can get anxiety from, you know, the people that you're connecting with who are, who are stressed as well. And if that, that kind of keeps on creeping up, it takes you a while before you realize that you're under the weather. And then at that point, you're so far gone that you 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 lose some of your, uh, or it seems like you'd lose, you know, some of your capacity to act. Um, and, you know, you can even think, oh, I should tap. But then, you know, when you're, when you're 
stress and overwhelm is up here, you can have that thought and it's like, and, and then the thought can come back, what's the point, it won't work, it's too big, this, you know, the problems are still there. And the challenge is that we are uh, so used to listening and responding to the thinking mind uh, and seeing that as as us and, and real, rather than, uh, you know, okay, let's just start this process and uh, progressively, you know, those thoughts will quieten down or they'll still be there, but they don't have the impact. You, you're not emotionally saluting them every time they come up the flagpole, you know? Yeah, it's that emotional tagging on those thoughts that gives them the charge. And so, like, just for example, one of the, the things that people have to realize about this new field of memory reconsolidation and extinction is that when you reconsolidate those memories after tapping, so you've you worked on maybe a current fear, maybe a past event, and you then finish your emotional triggering is a lot less, you're then reconsolidating the memory without all of that emotional tagging. But what's extinct in the extinction part of it isn't the event, you aren't extinguishing the event, you're extinguishing the emotion. So now somebody says to you, oh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is down below 20,000, and you don't have any real reaction to that. You just listen as a piece of information, or they, they say, um, we're experiencing this huge kind of dislocation in our economy and government. And again, those the, the, these are facts. You take them as facts, but you aren't emotionally engaged with them. I think you're, you're really spot on in, in emphasizing that it's the emotional engagement that drives our stress level high, our cortisol level high, and then starts to really distract us from having a good life. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I call it, you know, the emotional attachment. And uh, to me, you know, uh, this is this is actually what uh, led me to uh, to discovering this process I call intention tapping. Um, you know, it was was during a difficult period in my own life, and uh, I was using a lot of tapping. I, I was using every technique at my disposal at the time to try and deal with the, the overwhelm in my life and the physical pain from uh, you know this heel spur that I had and all this stuff that wasn't working in my business and my life. And uh, I I, uh, I was rereading. Byron Katie's fantastic book, Loving What Is. And she has a statement there, which is, uh, it's not the thought, it's the attachment to the thought that causes suffering. And I, and I, my realization was, of course, you know, it's the emotional attachment, you know, and when you use tapping, you can, you, you release that emotional attachment, and then you can have the thought without the emotion. And so this is, this is what uh, I see as as the big problem, you know, your mind wants to be able to think about all the bad things can happen to prepare you for them. You know, the only problem is that if you attach to them, then you're living in them and now you're experiencing them as if they're real and they're not real. So in fact, you're, you're attached to a, a fantasy creation of the mind and you are now experiencing it in your nervous system as if it's really happening. But when you do tapping and it works, it releases the emotional attachment. So you can look at that from outside. You can see the possible scenarios. You can go, okay, that could happen. And so in order to, to accommodate that situation, here's how we'll deal with it, or here, here's how we'll prevent it, or here's how we'll go around it, all those kind of things. You know, you're, you're able to allow your mind to think more freely rather than to get stuck on one way of thinking and go into it as if it's the only possibility, you know? So tell us more about intention tapping, because your trajectory, of course, was being an EFT <clears throat> practitioner early on in the 1990s, and then you were really instrumental in helping kickstart EFT research, and then doing EFT, and then you developed simple energy therapies and SET, and I'm not familiar with your intention tapping methods, so please do share more. Okay, so, um, so yeah, we, you know, Dr. David Lake and I, um, David actually went over with me originally to Gary Craig's uh, workshop in 1998, February 1998, overcame his public speaking phobia on stage with Gary back then. It's a fantastic session. You know, you could probably find that video online somewhere. Um, we started collaborating together and uh, David, since he'd overcome his public speaking phobia, started presenting with me. We were teaching people EFT at the time uh, with Gary's blessing. And, um, and then we progressively started to test and challenge some of the assumptions of, of the approach. And we developed our own simplified way of using this. You know, we, 
we uh, we realised that you could uh, you could get success without having to use setup statements. So we simplified the process that you didn't need to use um, uh, reminder phrases. This in, in our SET approach because you you know sometimes if you have an image you don't need to put that in words. If you have a feeling you can just focus on the feeling and mindfully work with the issues that come. Uh, we developed continual tapping, we developed the finger tapping, you know, these, these, these became what we called SET. And, uh, you know, I've been using that successfully for, for many years and combining it with uh, various other approaches. Well, this discovery uh, came, as I said, you know, at a time when I was having a lot of trouble in my life and some pain and, uh, and some, you know, challenges in my business as well and frustration upset at myself because, you know, I think I went into psychology out of frustration with myself, you know. <laughs> I'm still trying to work through that issue many years later. I've had I had some success. Um, anyway, uh, even back when we met Gary back in that uh, original workshop, you know, after having originally learned tapping from his uh, videotapes, we were talking then about intention and whether intention could produce healing and you know whether we really even needed to use the tapping and you know there were people like Larry Nims who who developed his own approach which originally used tapping and then didn't use tapping you know it included a you know what's become a fairly long uh, and involved instruction to the unconscious or he calls it the subconscious mind um, anyway in this moment of realization that I had reading this quote in uh, Byron Cody's book and the realization that yeah tapping releases the emotional attachments I actually had the question, what if, what if I just used intention? Would a pure intention just do this? So I focused on my challenge, my biggest challenge at the time, and I formed a simple intention. I release all my emotional attachments to this problem. And I felt whew, the same thing that happens when, you know, when you're tapping and you have a shift that's a big noticeable shift. It just happened just like that. And, uh, and then I thought, well, that was interesting. Let's try it on something else. And so I found another aspect of the problem and I, I used the same simple process. You know, I release all my emotional attachments to this. Whew. It was just like magic, you know, it was like every single time I used this simple intention, there was a release. And then, of course, I was like, this can't be right. You know, I must be, you know, I must be just convincing myself of this. You know, the judging mind started to come in. But I did it again and I did it again and I did it again. And I just moved through aspect after aspect after aspect, just like that, just like that, just like that. Um, and then eventually I've, I, I got to a point where I noticed that there was a, a tightness in my chest. And of course, I, I, my realization was, yeah, behind the problem or, you know, associated with the problem, there's always a disturbance in energy flow. And when tapping works, it restores the energy flow. So then I, once again, I had the realization, what if I just use intention to restore the energy flow? So I simply formed the intention. I restore the right energy flow to my chest. Big expansion, you know, just, Big deep breath, all this, again, the same physical stuff that happens with tapping, but it just went, just went like that. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd started using it on everything. I went to my wife, I said, you know, she's used to this now after all these years with me. And I'm like, I'm even playing around with this thing. I'm just wondering if it'll work with you like it's worked with me. She felt it straight away, you know. She now uses it routinely. She does great big deep breaths. Um, and next morning back in here in the office and I um, was speaking with a friend over Skype. He had an issue with his family and it was really affecting him. And I said, mate, just try this, this statement, you know. I release all my emotional attachments to this family issue. And he said, boy, that was palpable. And uh, I've since started to experiment, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, variations of this that I have found uh, to, to really work, especially when you're using, working on uh, past issues and, and so on. Um, you know, as you said, when you're dealing with a memory, there's, uh, you know, when you're still upset by that, you're still in the memory as if it's, as if it's still happening to you. And so you're experiencing some of the same feelings. 
but when you get over that, you can look back at it. Typically, you know, it's in the past um, and you're outside of it, seeing what happened rather than being in what happened. So you can, you know, there are other intentions that I can use to put things back in the past. Um, and I, you know, initially I discovered that I could do this without tapping. And then I discovered that with tapping, it just, uh, you know, it just beautiful, uh, balanced way of helping the energy to move. Um, I've since discovered, um, you know, that, that you do need to, um, sometimes you need to wait a while for things to process through the mind body. Um, you know, sometimes you just keep tapping and waiting for the next aspect to arrive, just like you do when you're tapping normally. But all you're really doing here is you're integrating that with a process of intention, which I see as giving a direction to your unconscious mind to release those attachments. And uh, it's been working really well. And uh, I'm having some incredible results with it. I still pinch myself. It's a bit like, you know, when I first learned about tapping, it was like, this is ridiculous. Come on. This can't do this. What it's, you know, but it just does. It just does. So how critical is the language there? Because I imagine that for many people, the suffering, they're unclear and they don't know quite what to intend. Or they may, when I hear people formulate, for example, affirmations, I often help them sharpen them because they, uh, they can be pretty vague, fuzzy, unfocused. So how yes. critical is, is the language in the process? Well, the fantastic thing about this process, in a way, it's the opposite of what we encourage people to do with tapping. Because with tapping, you know, particularly with EFT, you know, with SET, we're a little bit more flexible and, you know, we're a little bit more all over the place and following the energy. But, um, you know, with tapping, it's very much about being specific. With this process, you can start as global as you like. So, for example, your mother upsets you or you're upset about your mother. You can simply say, I release all my emotional attachments about my mother. Now, that's as global as you can get, right? Um, and yet, if you do that, you just keep tapping, then the aspect will arise. It comes from the unconscious naturally as part of the process. And then you can just follow what comes up. So, so my uh, instruction to people is, is getting the conscious mind out of the way and allowing the unconscious to to truth, trustfully deliver. You know, I, I really uh, agree with Larry Nims. His theory is that the, you know, um, he, he calls it the subconscious. I, I, I differentiate between conscious, subconscious, and unconscious. You know, I believe the unconscious is actually uh, the part of you that's that's looking after you all the time and looking out for you all the time. To me, the subconscious is is a repository for um, for programmed learnings and beliefs and uh, all those kind of uh, you know, structural program stuff, which can sometimes be good for you and sometimes not so good. Um, whereas to me, there's a deeper part that's always looking out for you and always uh, knows what's good for you. Um, and it will even, for example, keep you from having to deal with all of that too soon because you couldn't handle it, you know? And um, kind of like, uh, what's that movie? Uh, with Demi Moore, Tom Cruise, you know, you want the truth, you can't handle the truth, you know, so you're <laughs> your unconscious knows what you can and can't handle, and it will hold all this stuff at this level until you're ready to deal with it. And, um, you know, when you use this process, it lets aspect after aspect out in a beautiful, gentle way to the degree that you can handle it. That's been my experience of using it. And uh, yeah, I'm just learning more and more about it every day that I use it. That's powerful. And we're beings of intention, we're beings of energy, we're beings of connection. We have these local minds, local bodies. And then of course we have the ability to commune with non-local mind. And when we are able to relax into that communion and be part of that that oneness this is what what the mystics have talked about for for centuries as they just talk about these 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 states where they just surrender and then there is no emotional attachment and they just are in that that flow and that's when all kinds of things can happen that can't happen when we're we're really attached so surrender i think is a sounds to me like it's really a key part of this process well, yeah, and this is a way to do it. It's kind of a practical way to do it. 
because, um, you know, if you tell people surrender, they're like, I'm not giving up, you know, like I'm not. <laughs> it's like telling people to accept. They think acceptance means giving in. They think it means agreeing with with the, the negative or, or whatever. Whereas actually it's the most empowering thing is you, the, the great, great thing when you release your attachments to what's happening in the world is that you only have to deal with what's happening in the world, not what's happening in your mind created world, which is, um, you know, often scaring the bejesus out of you far more than, you know, than what's real and right in front of you. So people point to those objective realities and say, these are facts. I'm not making this up. This isn't in my, just in my own awareness. That's a fact. That bank has crashed. I watched my retirement fund halve in value. I watched my investments go down. Uh, I have two friends who caught the virus. I, and, and, you know, and, and they're, I mean, they'll, you, you want bad news? <laughs> There's an endless supply yeah. of it right now. And they, sure. the, these all appear to be object of facts. And so they are triggering these emotions. And it's very easy for people to mistake those emotional triggers that result from those objective facts as being as real as the facts. And yet they're, they're triggers, you know. Uh, Steve, we, we recently had a real epiphany when uh, we began to look at um, immunology studies and then we realized we'd done this research three or four years ago showing that EFT raises immunoglobulins. So we literally, you know, confronted with all the same bad news as everyone else, we literally threw out our business plan for 2020 and pivoted and in two weeks developed three products to deliver immunoglobulin boosting techniques to people. And so confronted with all, those, all the bad news, we said, what can we do to help how can we unlock our creativity? And within two weeks, I just couldn't believe how fast we did this. We, my, yeah. my team had developed a free product, a very low cost, easy access product, and a really high end elaborate product, all to help people really boost their immunity. So um, the, the same circumstances, if we aren't attached, if we are surrendered, can result in totally different actions from the panic that people can get into when they say, oh, it's out there. I'm upset because of that thing going on. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and um, you know this is to the to the degree that we can adapt and adjust to what's what's happening. You know, is it to the degree to which we can then ride the wave rather than getting dumped by the wave, or at least dive under it and let it pass over 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 the top of us. You know, um, whatever we need to do to uh, to be able to survive. It's interesting. I was just talking to, you know, I just had our wedding anniversary. I know you just had yours as well. So um, congratulations. And uh, my wife was mentioning to someone that, you know, on our 25th wedding anniversary, we were sitting up on a hill waiting for a tsunami to pass in Thailand. Um, not the big tsunami. There was another um, tsunami. There was another earthquake, 9.4 earthquake in the exact same place with a tsunami evacuation. You know, we were in our... Uh, we were in our hotel room on the beach, on the third floor. We had to go downstairs, uh, you know, with the alarms ringing, run 400 metres parallel to the beach to get to the evacuation place to, to go up the hill. And um, and in the end, it wasn't um, there wasn't a big tsunami because the original one, uh, the, the, the earth went like that, whereas this one, the earth went across. Mm. And so it was 9.4, but it only caused a small tsunami wave rather than a big tsunami wave. But while we were up on the hill, man, there was a lot of projection happening. If you if you can imagine, you know, it was so fantastic to have the tapping to be able to uh, to to use with people. Um, and you know, in that situation, of course, you know, when the alarm is there, then you, then you want to you know you want to get get moving and get running and and you know get yourself to safety. And then in the end, we were sitting up on the hill, and there was a lot of people, you know creating all kinds of things in their mind. I said to my wife, look where we are. It's beautiful. You know? <laughs> we were just sitting up on top of a beautiful hill. You know, okay, the midges were a little bit annoying after a while, but once we dealt with the midges, it was fine, you know. Um, now, everything about this isn't fine. There are people that are being impacted. There are people that are... Uh, you know, all of us are going to deal with grief at some point in our lives. All of us are going to deal with with trauma at various times in our lives. And the, the challenge is 
to allow life to move us and move through us. This is the way I believe our emotions are meant to, to move us and move through us. And it's when we stop them, you know, we say no to things. You know, I love uh, Tapas Fleming. She says a trauma happens when we say no to something that's a yes. It's real. And so we allow it to be real. We allow it to move us. We allow it to move through us. And um, if it gets stuck and we get overwhelmed by those feelings, either we're like, okay, this is too big for me to handle, um, you know, so I try and push it away or, or whatever I do to try and suppress it or I do anything to try and uh, medicate the feelings, you know. Tapping allows the feelings to move through. This new intention process allows the, the energy to, to flow, you know, and then you can flow with whatever happens to you. The only real certainty any of us has is knowing that we can deal with whatever happens, you know. And I always say the biggest thing that anything can cause you, the biggest challenge anything can cause you is how it makes you feel. And if, if you, you know, how it makes you feel. It doesn't make you feel that, but it seems like it makes you feel that, you know, but two people in the same situation, they don't feel the same thing because they're having different emotional associations to that. It means they're creating different meanings about that. But okay, you have an overwhelming meaning, you're overwhelmed by the situation. Well, start tapping and then, you know, just say, I release all my emotional attachments to the coronavirus. I release all my emotional attachments. You know, I, I, I love to do it on, you know, um, all the things that you're judging, you know, like, cause man, there's a lot of judging. You know, I release all my emotional attachments to what everybody should be doing, you know, and to what everybody should not be doing. This can be really powerful to, you know, to free you up, to be able to, to realize, hey, I'm sitting here right now, you know, right now I'm safe, right now I'm here. You know, bring yourself back to where you really are. And of course, that's the goal of spiritual practice is to bring you into the present moment, not be lost in the future, not be lost in the past, but be in that eternal present. Steve, if you could just end with one story of a client that perhaps somebody you worked with recently who was in distress, who was really not handling this well. Maybe it was a combination of personal factors and global factors, but then you use these techniques. So let's have to just, just, have, just walk us through a session and what the outcome was as that person was able then to shift, transform, and surrender. Oh my God. Okay. Um, uh, I'm thinking of about eight at once. Maybe I can just do a composite. Um, but, you know, certainly there was one person who was having a lot of panic, you know, uh, panic anxiety about this thing. And just starting with the, you know, I release all my emotional attachments to the coronavirus. And then it was clear that the panic is associated with, you know, projections. So I like to, you know, the mind projects, I like to call it a fantasy. Um, I'm going to credit Willem Lammers because I've heard him use this term in his approach. And it's, it's a lovely one because... You know, the mind is creating a scenario and then, you know, you attach to that as if it's real. So in this lady's case, you know, she was imagining herself getting the virus and dying, a, you know, a horrible death and with lots of suffering, of course, because the mind just loves to add in lots of suffering into these scenarios, you know. So, um, you know, I like to use a more provocative approach. So I like to exaggerate the, the, the negative with people humorously, you know, with their permission. And um, so I, you know, I had her using statements like I release all my emotional attachments to the fantasy that I'm going to catch the virus and I'm going to die a cruel, horrible death, you know. And uh, just within minutes, she's laughing and breathing and, you know, um, we, we, we uh, released the, um, we restored the energy flow. I, I, I use her statement, I restore the energy flow or I restore the energy balance to this area. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, in her throat, in her chest, in her diaphragm, in her stomach, and it just all opened up, you know, and, um, yeah, she's in a beautiful state afterwards, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, you know, everybody, this is actually in a group and people are saying, you know, the softness in her face and the, the soft, the softness in her voice, because the, when people start talking about these scenarios, there's also a harshness. I, I, I should mention that when we're upset 
and we have a problem, we almost always blame ourselves for having the problem as well. And so I actually released her attachments to what she should be feeling and what she should be thinking and what she should be doing. Because, you know, sometimes we tell people, oh, you know, you need to tap and you need to do this. And it comes across judgmentally. And so for her, it was like, you know, the, a big release on what I should be feeling and what I shouldn't be feeling, you know. If you have the bad feelings and then you object to them, now you're attached to not having those feelings. And now the more you try and push them away, the more they want to express and, and process. And so once you can allow the feelings to move through your body, then, you know, they express and then they're gone. You know, the, the, the energy returns to flow. It is remarkable to watch people shift and change. Their faces change, their body language change, their range of motion change. They become much freer in their bodies and their, their views of the world change. And then I love laughter. It's just amazing how often people will have been so completely fixated in their tragic story. And then within a little while, 15, 20, 30 minutes, they're just laughing at themselves in the world and it just doesn't seem real anymore. So it's it's yeah. so wonderful to see those energy shifts reflected in humor yes. and body language and every other dimension of our being. Well, and I also had a um, you know one of my students who, who actually contracted the virus and she, she wrote to me and she said, it's been fantastic to be able to use this technique to deal with not only my own projections, you know, that this, you know, this kind of guarantees I'm going to the grave, but also to deal with the projections of those around me who are thinking that that's going to be the case, you know? So she had to deal with other people's fears that, that this uh, was going to be the meaning. And it was just really freeing for her to be able to do that, you know, and to, to allow her body then to be able to do what it needs to do to get through. I so long, Steve, to see these techniques available to more people. They are already available to many people and they are spreading. And I just look forward to the day when people walk into a hospital or clinic and the first thing they get is a, a, an app and they just use these techniques right away. So thank you so much for being on the leading edge of discovery and practice and your very rich clinical experience in this field, how you're always exploring, discovering new things, experimenting, having fun. I, I really deeply appreciate that about you. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with the world. Well, thank you, Dawson, for everything that you do to, uh, to take our field forward. I know that you're, you know, you're doing this on a Sunday night in your, in your time and uh, I'm here on a holiday Monday and, uh, you know, that's, that's part of what we do here is to, to get this out to, to people, to, to spread the good word and to spread the good techniques and get people using them. So really appreciate everything that you do and I've, uh, you know, it's always fun. We're just passionately committed to seeing people not suffer and whenever I, I see people suffering who I know need to be, it motivates me more. Thanks again, Steve, and yeah. keep up the good work. Thank you.